I struggled coming into today's episode with coming to grips about how best to explain to you in a context that you can grasp and easily understand just how old and long the Babylonian Empire existed. And there's a lot of ways to go about it. So I'm going to go about it a few different ways. And I hope at the end of this, you can uh, have a good, respectful understanding of just how old and incredibly ancient uh, not only Babylon is to us, but what later Babylonians would feel to the start of their own empire. So if you can think in your head, what are some of the oldest and longest running empires that you can think of? Well, uh, some people might think of the Holy Roman Empire that lasted approximately 1,000 years. You might think of the Roman Empire that lasted approximately 1,400 years, 1,400. Now there's lots of varying dates about when the empire ends. But if we count basically to the final uh, sacking of Constantinople, we're about uh, 1,480 years, 1,480 years for the Roman Empire. That's pretty damn long. The Ethiopian Empire lasted about 600 years, straight into the modern era. Haile Selassie was the last Ethiopian emperor. The Canaan Empire covered Chad, Libya, and Niger also lasted for about 600 years. Now you may also think about the Abbasid Caliphate, which was uh, one of the first established uh, Muslim empires, really a successor to the Babylonians and the Persian Empire before them. Now you may also uh, easily be thinking of, well, why isn't he talking about China? China is certainly one of the longest running empires in the entire history of the world that we have. They may be the longest uh, running empire. And that all really all depends on when you count the end of the China Chinese empire. You know, it lasted about 1,766 years. If you count from the first Shang dynasty, which was really a kingdom of the Yellow Valley region, until about 207 that was when there was a the empire broke up into uh, about uh, a few dozen warring states now you could very easily make the argument and a lot of people do that the empire survives that civil war intact and uh, there is in fact an unbroken empire of china until 1967 when the last emperor was deposed. Now, that would make very easily China the longest running empire. And even if you do not count um, the period from after the warring states as a continuous single running empire from its initial Shang dynasty start, it's still the longest running empire of about 1500 years. 
which would make it older than the Roman Empire, even if you do not count the period after the Warring States. Now, Babylon has existed as an empire in one form or another for 1,795 years. Approximately 2,334 BCE to 539 Common Era. That is a stupidly long period of time. I, I struggled myself to wrap my head around how long a period of time that is. And you might think, well, you know, it's just a long period of time. It is. But I think, you know, to, to give you an idea of how much change would happen. And we often think of the ancient world as static, but it's really not. You, you know, st static in terms of technology, static in terms of fashion, clothing, how things are done. Uh, and to an extent, it's a little bit true, but it's also a very uh, reductive uh, way of looking at history. So to give us some context of how long 1,795 years is, let's go back in time 1,795 years from today. And if we did that, Europe and the world is a very, very, very different place. For one, the Roman Empire is at its height. It's at the tail end of what's called the Pax Romana period, which is about a 200 year breadth of time of Rome being basically at peace with itself, not so much with its neighbors, but peace internally. The empire is at its greatest extent ever. Latin is basically the common language of all of Europe, the Mediterranean and chunks of Asia and North Africa. And speaking earlier of the Abbasid Caliphate, one of their precursors would be the last fully Persian empire has formed, the Sasanians. That would be covering uh, Iran, uh, Afghanistan, and uh, basically they're the ones that are on the borders with the Roman Empire. Now they're um, at their height, but in a few hundred years there will be steamrolled by the Muslim expansion out of the Arabian Peninsula and out of that will come the Abbasid Caliphate. That's still a few hundred years away. China talking about the Warring States period. China is at the start of what's called the Three Kingdoms period, which is almost the end of a 300 year long civil war amongst various Chinese warlords for control of the empire. Now all those things are obviously not real anymore. They're just pieces of history we learn. But just to think about how much our own cultures have changed from that time, and this is me coming at it from a very uh, Western um, vision of it. My apologies to uh, listeners in other regions of the world. But as of 1795 years ago, no one knows who the hell Attila the Hun is. Christianity is more of a little uh, interesting cult rather than a major force. Less than 2% of the entire Roman Empire is Christian or has even heard of it. Anybody who has 
They just think of it as a little Jewish cult. The first Council of Nicaea hasn't happened yet. That's still a uh, hundred or so years away. Christianity as a religion that we understand it would be basically alien to how it exists back then. Service is in Latin. There is the concept of God and a person named Jesus, but their relation to each other, whether or not Jesus was divine, a manifestation of God on earth, all that's up in the air. All these little cults have their little own ways of doing things. So Christianity is a very alien thing compared to how it is today. Islam does not exist yet. The prophet Muhammad is yet to be born. If you're thinking from a military technology perspective, crossbows don't even exist yet. Knights do not exist yet. It's just cavalry. The compass as a technology used to navigate has only recently been employed in China. The rest of the world just thinks of lodestone as a, a, a funny little neat mystery. And speaking of religions, Buddhism is just starting to get its feet out from under itself and establishing itself as a religion. And myself, again, thinking from my Western perspective, uh, you may be wondering about language. Latin, of course, is the dominant language in most of Europe and the Mediterranean. Of course, the Romans are in control of large chunks of what they call Brittany or Britannia. But even Proto-Old English does not even exist as a language. The Angles and the Saxons have not yet left their homelands and begun their migrations into England. Thinking uh, tectonically, the entire continent of Australia has moved 120 meters north from 1,795 years ago to today. And just imagine all the changes that have happened to our civilizations in what is effectively 1,800 years. Religion has deeply evolved. As much as people like to think their religion might be an untouched thing from the time it was birthed, it has changed wildly, especially Christianity. And that change happens through the interactions with other cultures, through the thoughts and interactions between younger generations and older generations, how society thinks and interacts with gods, the religions, and the other people in the world, that changes. There would have been multiple plagues, multiple droughts, floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, all these things have come and gone. And all these things cause refugees, cause mass population migrations, climates have shifted, languages have been born, evolved, and died in 1800 years. So, this amount of time, it would not be possible to do justice to how incredible the amount of changes that would happen to an empire over an 1800 year period of time. 
we could spend 20 episodes talking about Babylon and just be getting into the real deep understanding of it. So I'm not going to tackle that. Uh, instead, what we're going to talk about is some broad strokes about Babylonian dynasties. We'll touch on a few major people and significant events of importance in Babylonian history. And then we'll lock on to our period of time that intersects with our fictional Warhammer 40,000 universe and look at the text there, look at what actually happened, and then see if we can draw some interesting conclusions. Now, one of the interesting features of the Babylonian Empire, and this is really a feature of a few other significant civilizations, is whenever they're conquered, they don't really become the nation of the country that conquers them. It's more or less the other way around. China has this feature as well. Even though China, China over its uh, thousands of year history has been invaded and conquered by multiple different uh, nations and civilizations, in the end, these people tend to uh, meld themselves and get swallowed up by the Chinese culture and civilization. The culture changes a little bit, the civilization changes a little bit, but it stays more or less Chinese. It's just got a slightly different flavor to it now. The Persian Empire has a similar influence, even as it's conquered by Muslims in the later centuries, and Islam being a significantly different um, culture influence than the reigning Zoroastrianism religion. The Persian Empire uh, of uh, later Muslims still looks a lot like the Persian Empire pre-Muslim. The Babylonian Empire has that same influence. And even as it's conquered by various different cultures over the period, sooner or later, these people end up claiming the kingship of Babylon rather than attempting to destroy it or destroy the civilization and just absorb it into their own empires. They hold Babylon to its own thing, a little bit like uh, the Vatican inside Italy, inside Rome. It's a special place. Babylon has that kind of influence on the region. So to start, as we wind time way back to the pre-Babylonian period, we're in the uh, early 3000s to uh, late 2800s, 2500s BCE, that, that few hundred year period. If you were with me in our last series when we were talking about uh, Copper Age 40,000, um, we talked about the world of the Copper Age, and we talked uh, quite a bit about what's called the Uruk period or the Uruk expansion. Well, in the Uruk expansion, that's basically southern Iran, or pardon me, southern Iraq from the Persian uh, coastline. And they started conquering their neighboring cities. 
and uh, that went back and forth with each other. But this is basically early warfare of a lar- pardon me, early large scale warfare and attempts to conquer other neighboring cities and starting to form something that might look like a nation. Well, as that Uruk period comes to a close, there is a king by the name of, and uh, pardon me, obviously I do not speak ancient Sumerian, but there is a king there by the name of Lugal Zagazi. And Lugal Zagazi conquered a significant chunk of the southern city-states closest around the Persian Gulf, be around modern-day Basra, if you're looking at a map of uh, Iraq right now. So Lugal Zagazi had conquered a significant chunk of southern Iraq and uh, was claiming kingship over those areas. Now there's an argument to be made that he's the first Babylonian king. But typically we mark the first Babylonian king with the guy who defeats Lugal Zagazi. That man is a man by the name of Sargon. Nobody knows who his actual name is. We only know uh, what he called himself. And if we're speaking his language, Akkadian, we would pronounce his name uh, Sharokin, which means true or legitimate king. But we know him as Sargon of Akkad, or more commonly we might call him Sargon the Great. Now remember when I was talking about the Uh, age and stupefying length of civilization of of the Babylonian period and how uh, refugees, mass migrations, and all these things uh, make up huge population shifts. Well, Lugal Zagazi speaks Sumerian We would call him culturally Sumer. And the city-states of southern Iraq at this time, they are all this Sumerian culture. Sargon is Akkadian, or Akkadian. I I don't know how you pronounce it. We'll, We'll call him Akkadian. Now, Sargon, like all great kings from this period, has a kind of mythological origin story. His mother, who was a priestess of Ishtar, cast him in a reed basket down the Euphrates River to protect him from people trying to murder him. Now, if that sounds like a familiar story to you, maybe uh, of the someone by the name of Moses, Just remember when I was talking in my last episode about the uh, people of Jerusalem being cast into slavery and forced into the city of Babylon. They spent uh, several hundred years basically in captivity in the main city there. And while In this city, they decided to write down their religion. Now, that isn't the only influence Babylonian captivity would have had on them. Keep in mind, Babylon has been around for civilization for several hundred years, and Jerusalem has been under the Babylonian thumb in one form or another, for basically the entirety of its existence. Remember when I was talking uh, several episodes ago about the spread of culture and ideas and religion, it's not hard to see how the culture and religious themes of a dominant civilization would eventually bleed into a subservient civilization 
just by being exposed to it for hundreds of years. Now Sargon, who's taken up by a gardener of the king, Sargon is raised as his child. He eventually becomes the cupbearer of the actual king. And this is the king of Kish, who's in central Iraq, roughly uh, just south of where modern day Baghdad is. Well, our uh, soon to be conquered king, Lugal Zagazi, while well, he's busy conquering the southern city-states of this area, the king of Kish gets word that Lugal Zagazi has put eyes on the city of Kish. And what do you do? Well, you can either submit and become a client state of Lugal Zagazi and his burgeoning Babylonian kingdom, or you put an army together and you go out and fight him. Well, that's what he did. And for some reason, the king of Kish put Sargon in charge of the army. And I say it's a little weird because normally at this period, the king would lead the army. But he doesn't. Sargon leads the army. And I would guess that at this time, Sargon's probably usurped the throne of Kish, and he's probably actually the one in charge. But we don't know exactly how Sargon comes to be in command of the kingdom of Kish and its army, but that's what he does. You have to wonder how Sargon came to be king of Kish. I do anyways. This is a man who uh, thought fairly highly of himself and certainly wasn't uh, at all timid or ashamed about uh, self-promotion. And yet, um, you know, we can't find any records of how the King of Kings uh, became the King of Kish. And one of the disadvantages of not being a historian is not being able to maybe be as current to uh, all the modern pieces of information that are being revealed even today about Mesopotamian societies and history. But while that's a disadvantage, one of the advantages, and maybe it's advantage, maybe it's not advantage, but I think of it as an advantage is when you're just an amateur uh, history podcaster like me, um, you know, you can ask some questions that don't have answers and and maybe run through some uh, fantasy what if scenarios. So I like to think if we're, you know, are uh, place ourselves in the imaginary court of Kish, and we have uh, this young man, Sargon, the son, adopted son, but the son of the gardener for the king of Kish, and we think, how does somebody who's the son of a gardener ingratiate himself to the king? You know, maybe um, maybe for whatever reason, he, 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 you know, Look, got a pretty face about him. Um, maybe he's an effective gardener, and the king of Kish really appreciates his gardens. And maybe as a uh, you know a a royal nod to the gardener, we have the young son of the gardener. We promote him to be our cupbearer. You know, that's not necessarily a job that doesn't come without risks. Sure, you're the cupbearer of the king, but if somebody poisons the king, you're the first one to find out about it before the king does. Then, you know, that's your job is, yeah, you hold the king's cup, 
Um, but uh, you take the rest before he does if somebody's going to poison him. But, you know, if you want to take over the kingdom of Kish, being the cupbearer isn't a bad spot to be if you want to usurp the throne, isn't it? Maybe, you know, you, you cut a deal with some of the uh, local lords, you know, you're you're the cut, you're you're the cupbearer. You're in all the meetings where the king might be having some wine and food. You're always with them. You're always seeing the people coming and going. You're in the background, but you're hearing all the people complaining. God, man, the, this king of Kish, he's really getting my guff. He's always asking for taxes I don't have. He's always asking for people for raising his wars, and we're never really winning them. You know, we're barely holding on. And now, now what are we gonna do? We, we've got Lugal Zagazi, he sent us a letter. You know, there's gonna be a battle come uh, next season, you know, the next season of war. And we, we've got a choice, we can go face him this date, or we can submit. Well, what do you do? You know, the maybe the king, maybe Sargon, kind of being a little diplomatic player, here's all this little stuff going on. Hey, hey, you know, um, I hear your your pain, and, and I see that too, and I got a solution for you. You know, maybe, maybe we slip something into the king's wine, and me being the cupbearer, I'd be the right guy to do it, and we can make sure it gets to the king. There's no heirs. So somebody's got to take over. How about how about that be me? And you support my claim and I'll give you you know th- these farms will will uh will take the textiles from here. We'll give you some slaves. We'll give you uh some silver and the copper mine rights that, that we've got access to. And this guy might be, yeah, you know, that sounds like a good idea. I mean, you don't, not everybody is going to want to be king. You know, there's a lot of pressure that goes with that. Somebody's always trying to conquer you. So maybe we can kill two birds with one stone here, being a, a local noble in the city of Kish. Maybe we get rich. We get rid of our King of Kish problem. We support this kid Sargon and and make him the new king. And if he loses to Lugal Zagazi, he's the one who loses it, loses his head, not me. And maybe I'm the one that Lugal Zagazi just kind of leaves in charge as the governor of the province. So this is a win-win situation for these little nobles, opportunity is always, if you're looking uh, three steps ahead. So maybe that's how Sargon came to be king of Akkad, king of Kish. Maybe, well, it might not be, it might be something completely different. Maybe the king of Kish adopted Sargon. Could be. Well, we'll never know. We don't have that record. And certainly adoptions happened. But eh, I just like to ask that that question. You know, I can't give any answers. Maybe, you know, this isn't a podcast to find answers, but it's a podcast to ask questions. And maybe down the line, uh, we'll be able to get somebody on the horn uh, as a guest who might be able to answer that question. That would be kind of cool. But uh, let's get back to the podcast now. I just kind of dropped on a little tangent there, a little what if, how or, or how, not necessarily a what if, but, you know, how does somebody who's a nobody become king? Well, our king of Kish, Sargon, goes out to fight Bugal Zagazi. And, well, just read Sargon's own words about what happened there. Sargon, the king of Akkad, 
the bailiff of Ishtar, the king of the universe, the anointed one of An, the king of the land, the governor of Enlil. He vanquished Uruk in battle and smote fifty governors in the city by the mace of the god Ilaba. And he destroys its fortress and captured Lugalzagezi, the king of Uruk in battle, and he led him to the gate of Enlil in a neck stock. And when I say these are Sargon's own words, this is obviously what was written about him or what he commanded to be written about him and his battle with Lugal Zagazi. Regardless of how it actually turned out, obviously Sargon thinks a lot of himself, the king of Akkad, the bailiff of Ishtar, who's a goddess, by the way, the king of the universe, the anointed one of On, another god, the king of the land, the governor of Enlil, another god. This is a man who's closely associated himself with several gods. He's the bailiff of Ishtar, of which his mother was a priestess. Regardless of how he thinks of himself, this is a common way of how rulers spoke of themselves. Everybody trying to outdo each other for how great and important they are. But the end result is Sargon won the day and Lugal Zagazi is in a neck stock under Sargon's thumb. And now Sargon controls all the lands from central Iraq straight to the Persian Gulf. He is suddenly the one of the most powerful forces in uh, this region at this time. And he uses uh, this power to conquer neighboring lands. Now Sargon and his son and grandson, they institute some reforms of their, uh, what is now one of the largest empires in the world at the time. They make Akkadian or Akkadian the official language of the entire nation. All cities must speak it. That's the official language of state and business. However, all religious practices and all official writing, anything to do with mathematics or science or engineering, all of this is in the language of the Sumerians. In a way, Sumerian becomes a lot like Latin. It's a respected language, but it's a language that kind of dies out, and it's the language that's used in religious practices, much like how Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox uh, perform their services in Latin. It's used in the language of science and mathematics when written down, much like our uh, Latin classifications of uh, animals and species. So it becomes a semi-dead language. Now the southern uh, Babylonians, these would be the Sumerian people, of course, um, it's going to take them several generations to forget how to speak Sumerian. Akkadian is quite different. Akkadian is a Semitic language. Sumerian is, its com is a unique, distinct language on its own, not based on the Semitic peoples. But Akkadian becomes the de facto spoken language of everyday life. And Sumerian uh, goes the way of Latin. Now, if you can picture the Mideast and the Persian Gulf, we have uh, Iraq, 
coming up from the Persian Gulf. And just to the east of Iraq is Iran, surrounding the Persian Gulf. One of the major chunks of Iran is a area known as Shiraz. That is a nation called Elam at the time. And the Elamites are a major player in this story. The Elamites, in one form or another, over the entire period here, are constantly in battle against the Babylonian Empire. They don't like to be conquered. Who would? But the Babylonians have their way under Sargon and his children. And they conquer this region of Iran. They also conquer what would be called modern-day Syria. It's Assyria at the time. They conquer chunks of southern Anatolia. They conquer uh, most of the Levant. So that would be Lebanon, Cyprus as well, which has uh, major tin mines or major copper mines. So, in conquering all these areas, Sargon and his heirs are forming uh, one of the first empires. And that empire is feeding itself from all these client city-states that are forced to give tribute. Now, if you listen to our first episode in uh, this Bronze Age series, I read to you an excerpt of the Curse of Akkad. The Curse of Akkad is talking explicitly about this period. And this period is the end of the first Babylonian dynasty. It's the end of Sargon and his heirs because they are invaded by the Gudians, Gushans. They're a people from the Near East. Their homeland was a place called Gudium, which is in and around the Zagros Mountains, which is the borders between Iran and Iraq. Again, they didn't want to be conquered any more than the Elamites did. Only instead of the Elamites getting conquered, the Gudians conquered the Babylonians and the Gudians destroyed the main city of Akkad during this time there were droughts and famine widespread uh, disease it was a period of extreme instability for the Babylonians this is what's in the curse of Akkad so there's a period of many different kings reigning for short times. They're fighting, they're killing, people are trying to break away from each other. But it eventually settles down after a brief civil war. And we have uh, what we would call the Third Sumerian Period and a king by the name of Urnamu. And I mention him because Urnamu is the first king that writes the laws down that we're aware of. Now, Urnamu, King Urnamu, he's about 300 years, give or take, before Hammurabi and uh, what, what's traditionally uh, been thought of as the first time law codes have been written down. Now, uh, I don't want to call this out as though this is some unique invention of course, the laws uh, of the land have been there for quite a long time. People knew about them, and it may have been they were written earlier even than this. But as far as archaeological evidence is told, Urnamu, King Urnamu, is the first per person to write down a code of laws. And I thought I might share a few of those laws with you before we move on. So the first one I want to read out to you 
If a man committed a kidnapping, he is to be imprisoned and pay 15 shekels of silver. If a man proceeded by force and deflowered the virgin slave woman of another man, that man must pay five shekels of silver. That's roughly 66 Canadian dollars, if you're a Canadian listener. If a man knocked out the eye of another man, he, should, he shall weigh out half a mina of silver. And a mina, it's roughly one and a quarter pounds, which would equal roughly 800 Canadian dollars. So you can see the value of uh, maiming versus the value of raping another man's slave. And I just wanted to call this out, not only because we're talking about laws being written down here, uh, but I did want to just draw attention to how laws work. In the early Babylonian period, laws were fine-based mostly. You commit an offense, you pay a fine. Maybe you go to prison, but mostly you pay a fine. This does a few things. A, it allows, uh, obviously, wealth inequality to continue. Rich people have power over the poor. That's no surprise to anybody. But it also generates additional revenue for the kingdom. Now, the next part of the Babylonian history that we want to touch on briefly is a people called the Amorites. Now, the uh, Amorites are serious people. They migrate down from the Anatolian region through Lebanon, so through Lebanon, through Syria, into northern Iraq, and start making their way down south. And they are conquering cities left, right, and center as they go. The Amorites are no joke, and it's nothing the Babylonians have ever experienced before. And the Amorites conquer most, if not all, of Babylon. And they don't just stop there. The Amorites actually conquer Egypt. They become part of the Egyptian dynasties. And I want to call them out not only because they're a serious military force that effectively becomes the new Babylon, but because we have uh, three major cultural influences on the Mesopotamian region. We have the uh, Akkadians from central Iraq, we have the Sumerians from southern Iraq, and we have the Amorites from northern Iraq. And these people effectively become a cultural melting pot. And out of that melting pot comes what we would distinctly think of as a Babylonian cultural look and feel. Unique civilization melded from three constituent parts. And out of this parts comes a phenomenally powerful and culturally dominant empire. Now, one of the kings, perhaps one of the most famous kings during this Amorite dynasty would be one of the Babylonian kings most people think of when they think of Babylon, and that would be Hammurabi or Hammurabi. He, of course, writes his law codes, and one of the main differences between Hammurabi's law codes and the law codes of uh, King Urunamu from 300 years earlier is many of Hammurabi's law codes presume innocence. They are also not entirely based on 
uh, fines, eye for an eye, imprisonment, maiming, death. These are all penalties uh, that are in Hammurabi's law codes. Fines as well, of course. Now, Hammurabi isn't just famous for his law codes. He is also the reason why Babylon and the city itself becomes the cultural center of this region that everybody in later periods thinks it is. He makes his city the prime city. He invests a lot in construction, in public works. And one of the interesting things about how Babylonians performed their public works, certainly there were slaves, but Babylonians also had a concept of uh, enforced or mandatory civil service. And that civil service often took the form of being forced to do public labor for public works. That might include road building, temple building, wall building, you know, anything that the public itself would need to take part in. Slaves were part of the workforce, but so was it every single citizen's civic duty to uh, commit part of their life and time to doing these public works. So they would have basically uh, free labor from the entire uh, civilization to build uh, any sort of public work project. And the kings and royal families and the priests themselves were uh, not excluded from this duty. There are texts that describe the kings and their sons making clay mud bricks, burning them in the sun, baking them in the sun, and carrying them to build temples. They're doing the dirty work of manual labor. So you can imagine what a culture might feel like, look and feel like, if everybody from the lowliest slave to the highest princely king all had to do the same dirty work job. It's a little Spartan when you think of it. It builds a type of character that other neighboring civilizations do not have. Nobody is too good to do hard work. Now I know we've talked quickly about several of the early dynasties of Babylon, but we're effectively 700 years from Sargon the Great to Hammurabi. 700 years, again, is a stupidly long period of time for a nation to be around and nation's powers wax and wane. Well, at the start of Hammurabi's reign, Babylon is seen as uh, a minor power in the region. Nobody really thinks much of it. But by the time Hammurabi is done and handed the reins over to his ch children, Babylon has conquered almost the entirety of Mesopotamia right up to Lebanon. He's expanded their power into another major regional authority, basically almost to what it was under Sargon the Great. Now, while there's many, many interesting and fascinating things about Mesopotamian peoples, uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on before we start getting into the Tower of Babylon is the role of women in society. 
one of the things that's fascinating about Mesopotamians is the concept of gender. Um, males and only males can own and inherit property. Women were um, generally uh, subservient to men. However, there is an interesting legal situation that crops up several times and there's uh, evidence in actual Babylonian legal documents uh, about this thing called uh, Harimatu. And a Harimatu is a woman who is legally categorized as a male in order to be able to inherit and own property. So you can imagine a situation where a father who has uh, no male heirs or maybe doesn't like any of his male heirs and doesn't want his property and money to maybe default to the state or to go to a brother he doesn't like for whatever reason, uh, but he's got a daughter. So he can legally change the gender of his daughter to male and that legally enables the daughter to inherit and own property. So there's actual legal documents where um, a father will change his daughter's gender legally to male. She will inherit the homes, the slaves, the property, and all the finances of the household. And the sons are legally required to defer to her as the head of the household. And all her heirs then uh, will own the property at that. So it's called Harimatu and it's, it's extremely fascinating and there was another podcast and I'm going to direct you to that in a second uh, but they dedicated a whole podcast to the topic and I really encourage you to check that out. That podcast is called Peopling the Past. You can find it on most major podcast platforms and one of the co-hosts is from our very own local Acadia University uh, they're both professors of ancient history, uh, but they have a lot of fascinating uh, historical uh, scholarship guests. And the episode is called Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves, Mesopotamian Free Women with Dr. Stephanie Budin. As we dial in to the Tower of Babylon, I want to talk for a moment about the Babylonian religion. The duties of the priests, priestesses, and the kings were to take care of the gods. If you listen to my last episode on the Minoans, we discussed uh, the Minoan religion, but we also uh, went on a bit of a tangent about how significant and important religion was. It's not just a tool for controlling masses of people. That's a side effect of religion. It's not the main feature of it. The feature of the religion is to enable the people to communicate with and appease the gods so that the gods may either bless them if they're lucky or at least not destroy them. The gods were seen as mercurial, wrathful, jealous, petty. And you might think of that, you know, if you had a god of storms and one season you might get no rain and everybody would starve and nobody can figure out what happened, what did we do wrong? And another season, you might get a perfect amount of rain and have a lovely crops. You can imagine this happening for floods, for disease, in war, 
What did we do different than last time? Nobody knows. We must have done something to tick the gods off. It was the job of the religious class to commune with the gods and figure these things out. And uh, if you failed in your job, well, it could very easily mean the end of your civilization. So it's a very, very important job. Now, the Babylonians, if you recall or listen to my earlier episodes on the Copper Age when we discussed how gods were treated, well, the Babylonians uh, take that to 11. Gods existed in the heavens, in the celestial plane, wherever they were, but they also inhabited the cities in and around Babylon and the nations uh, that surround the Mideast and Levant. Everybody, and I mean everybody, believes the God inhabits a specific place within their city usually a statue in a temple in the middle of the city. So each city in the region would typically have their own god. There might be other temples in that city, but each city would typically be seen to be the city of an individual god. They treated those statues as though they were the gods themselves. And when I say that, I don't mean they just prayed to them. I mean, they literally fed the gods food. So they would take food that was given daily. It would be cooked in the temple and it would literally be fed to the god. Somebody would spoon it up to his mouth. They would pour wine over him honey, milk. This god would be getting the best of the best of food possible. Only the king would eat as well as the god. And if it came down to um, we have some ham to give to the king or that ham could be given to the god, but we don't have enough for both, it went to the god. So the god, the statue, ate better than the king. He would be clothed in the finest cloth from the best weavers. There would be jewelry made for him or her. They would uh, sing to the gods, not just pray to them. They would have musicians playing music while people sang to them to keep them entertained. They would tell stories to the gods and occasionally they would place the gods on uh, palanquins, which are, uh, you know, if you think uh, back to um, ancient Rome or ancient Egypt, when you would see somebody, you know, a noble person being carted around by slaves holding Um, a platform on some poles on their shoulders and they're walking around while the noble person kind of lays out on it. That's a palanquin. They would place these statues on the finest built palanquins and they would take them to visit other gods in other cities. So they treated the statues as though they were real gods that could eat food, drink wine, put on clothes, be entertained, go to visit other people in other cities. It was the duty of the priests to take care of the needs of the god. So this isn't just people sitting around in a nice cozy uh, temple somewhere out of the sun praying to their god once in a while and uh, doing services every now and then these are people dedicated to basically 
feeding and clothing and entertaining a god and if you do not do it right your god will get angry and punish you with plagues by losing battles with poor harvests so even though your job might be a cook you were guaranteed you were the best cook in the in the region if you were the cook in the temple these are people that worked for their gods the way um, the kings and queens and the everyday person would do their civil duty building public works projects nothing was too low no job was beneath anybody to get done you get done what you had to get done because it was what was needed now another interesting part of their religion was a annual festival to celebrate the planting of the harvest the festival called akitu is actually still practiced even today which is kind of neat um, you can look it up online uh, but it is effectively a 12-day festival that happens in april at the time when crops would traditionally be planted and there are uh, very important duties that happen on each day but the first day is effectively um, the recitation of prayers everybody begging the god of the city which for Babylon is Marduk for forgiveness begging him to protect the city protect its people on the second day the high priest would bring Marduk outside the temple they would bathe in the Euphrates River and there'd be more prayers special craftsmen would come out and they would make uh, special tools and toys and puppets uh, in order to uh, reenact the story of Marduk and on the fourth and fifth days there would be celebrations of the entire population people would sing dance there'd be feasting outside the city and on the fifth day this is the part I will, I am really interested in remember when we talked about how no job was too low even for the king to do making mud bricks taking them over to build the temple part of his civic duty well on the fifth day of Akitu the king is taken into the temple before the guard Marduk and all his kingly regalia is removed the king would be stripped effectively bare before the god Marduk and he would recite prayers and promises of obedience to look after the city on Marduk's behalf and the head priest had to slap the king as hard as he could to remind the king of his requirement of humility in front of the god that the king is no better than a common man when compared to the god Marduk and it was considered great fortune for the year if the slap was so hard it brought tears to the eyes of the king this was an especially auspicious sign that the year was going to go well for Babylon. Now, I'd like to just pause for a moment and imagine ourselves as the high priest. Maybe it's our first year as the new high priest. We've been observing, learning for the last several years, but for whatever reason, the previous high priest, maybe he died, passed on, whatever that was. And we're the new job, we're the new Joe with the job. And it's our job on this day of Akitu 
to stand in front of the god Marduk with the king, the king who would just as easily have somebody put to death for saying the wrong thing to him. And it's our job to strip the king naked, force him on his knees in front of the god Marduk, force him to say prayers of obedience to the god, and then, with all our might, haul off and slap the king across the face. And you better not give him a love tap. If you did that, if you feared the wrath of the king enough, and you can imagine the sweat coming down your brow your first year on the job, well, geez, I don't want to slap the king. But you must slap the king, and you must do it as hard as you can. The pressure you would have to give it all you got but boy you better not draw the king's blood the king might take that personally maybe that's what happened to the last high priest he got a little too exuberant maybe instead of a slap it was a closed fist But you can imagine the sweat coming down your brow your first year on the job and the king comes before you and you got to strip him naked and then you got to haul off and slap him as hard as you can and you better hope you draw tears from the king's eye otherwise there might be problems for the year so this festival was extremely interesting not only just because it Uh, was celebration of the entire city for this, for the the harvest. It also involved uh, ritual humiliation of the king, and it was considered an auspicious sign to draw tears from the king during his humiliation, after which the king received his crown again Uh, directly from the hands of the Marduk statue was presented to the population. This builds an interesting picture of the character and society of Babylonian people. They're people that see that no job is beneath them. There are people that see that the king needs to be kept in check. He needs to be reminded that he is not above anybody, that he is seen as just like any other common person before the eyes of Marduk, that every single person in the society, slave, lowborn, noble, or king has a requirement of civil duty and that civil duty can involve even the jobs as lowly as making clay mud bricks and hauling them to the temple. It builds an interesting character about the type of people and their attitudes towards hard work their attitudes towards uh, self-respect and humility, their attitudes towards each other as a people, but it also shows them potentially their attitudes towards other neighboring societies. Another fascinating part about Mesopotamian religion is that it is also effectively social services. Um, Mesopotamian temples were, as I discussed, responsible for feeding and clothing and providing uh, wealth and comfort to the god. In order to do that, the priests of the temples controlled large farms 
they had what you might call uh, kind of industrial types of manufacturing. You know, they're not using steam engines or anything, um, but they have lots of workers who are craftsmen doing weaving of textiles or uh, doing cooking, maybe making jewelry, doing pottery, you know, that sort of thing. And some of those goods are, uh, you know, stay within the temple. And some of that is traded and sold. And then that's used to buy other goods and services, which are then used within the temple. So priests can become uh, quite powerful and rich. And I mentioned it's also functions and social services because if you could not find work in Mesopotamia, you did not have food to feed yourself or your family or something along those lines, you didn't have a place to stay, you could, as a citizen, go to the temple and they would feed and clothe you. You know, you're not, you're not getting the same meal that uh, Marduk is. You're getting some stale bread and soup, uh, maybe a little bit of beer if you're lucky, but you're, you're at least not starving to death. You're getting clothes, probably maybe the, you know, the hand-me-down textiles that are errors that you can't sell as a trader to other cities. So, but in exchange, you are the workforce for the temple. Maybe you're uh, sweeping the temple grounds. Maybe you're de-weeding it. Maybe you're working the farms. Maybe you're cleaning the chamber pots or the pots and pans for, for the meals, whatever that is. You know, it's, um, you know, part social services, it's part, um, you know, 18th uh, or ni early 19th century uh, workhouse. It's part uh, religious complex. It's part factory. But this is another fascinating part of Mesopotamian society. And we've covered, as we've gone along, um, religion. We've talked uh, an awful lot about kings covering, uh, you know, a, few, a thousand or so year period. We've covered over some changes to the culture and society and how Babylon converts from, uh, you know, just a, a neighboring city to um, the the living, breathing heart of Mesopotamia from which culture and religion emanates out of, like some, um, you know, civilization, cultural, imaginary pressure wave uh, enforcing itself on the neighboring cities. We've talked about, um, you know, women and the free women of Babylonian societies, the Harimatu, who could become heads of households, own property, uh, command the uh, respect of even um, males within the same family who would have to uh, follow their orders. But we haven't touched on, you know, a little bit about what's real life like for the average citizen. And I say average citizen, that's really a, a misnomer. Be, let's talk about our maybe average, uh, you know, middle manager, our, our uh, administrator of crops or grain, maybe the guy who's responsible for um, making sure we've got enough grain to uh, brew beer and make bread so we can feed the workers at the temple. And, you know, it's that type of average Joe middleman. We can imagine he has a uh, daughter 
who's a, a grown woman, maybe not quite married yet, but getting to that age, she she's you know just at the right age. We can start trying to find a good husband for her. We've got a useless older son who's a chronic gambler and drunk and just all round idiot. Everybody's got one of those people in their family. And we've got uh, maybe a younger son who's still in school. And when I say school, I, I do mean school. There were schools then that you would send children to if you were going to train them to be uh, a priest or an administrator. They had to learn how to read and write. They had to learn math. And Assyrians and Babylonians and Mesopotamians had some fairly complex math at that time. So we, we've got our average kind of nuclear family, you might think of it. And in our nuclear family, we've got our son who uh, goes away to school. And, he, and when I say he goes away at school, this is like a boarding school. We, we send him away. He has clothes. He goes there for the season. He learns what he needs to do. And he will write us back. And when I say he writes us, he will write on, you know, a, a clay tablet in cuneiform. And he will send that back to us. And, uh, and I say this because we have actual records of a child writing to their parents, their mother specifically, but to their parents, who was away at kind of our Mesopotamian boarding school equivalent, complaining about how the other kids are making fun of him and bullying him because he does not have as good a clothes as everybody else does in school. The letter reads as though there are other children who have lesser status than his father that have better clothes than him, and they make fun of him because of it. That sounds an awful lot like any child in any day and age today in any school in the world. You know, I don't have the latest iPhone. The kids are making fun of me. Uh, I'm not wearing, um, you know, the latest designs. And I don't have the greatest shoes. You know, dad makes all this sort of money. And so-and-so's father works under dad. And he has all the great stuff. How come I don't have all the good stuff? Well, you don't because dad has debts because your older brother's a useless gambler and a drain on, drain on the family's money. So the kid's got to make do with what he's got. And, uh, you know, he's never going to get told that, but he's, he's going to complain about it anyways. And this happens even in Mesopotamia. And we can imagine our family uh, parental unit, you know, the father, we've got a lot of debts. We don't want to go into the workhouse. We don't want to become a temporary slave labor, which is a way to resolve debts back then. You could um, submit yourself to be a slave for a certain period of time until you paid off the debts. You don't want to do that, but we've got a useless son. We've got a competent daughter and no other heirs. We have another younger son who might be able to do it, but he's way too young right now to be the heir. So we sign a legal document. We want to disinherit our useless son from inheriting the family's wealth so that our youngest son, when he becomes of age, can run the household. But until that happens, we sign a legal document. We legally change the gender of our competent eldest daughter 
to a male, making her Harimatu. And then when we pass, she will inherit the family household wealth. She will be responsible for continuing to raise the youngest male child. And when he comes of age, he will then assume all the uh, wealth and ownership of the family. We've cut out our idiot useless son who's a chronic gambler from the uh, family heirs so we don't have to worry about um, you know losing any more money and uh, you know maybe we banish the son from the household and then what's the son gonna do he's useless he's got no skills he's an idiot son of a mid-level manager so he's got no prospects, no job, doesn't have a wife. You know, he's the 30-year-old um, loser kid, the, you know, for failure to launch movie, if you remember that. Somebody who just, you know, living in the family basement, playing video games all day, not looking for a job, drinking away whatever money he gets living off the family, sucking off the, you know, family finances. Well, now we kick him out of the house. Or maybe the parents pass, and the eldest daughter, the Harimatu, who's now the head of the household, maybe she's had enough of her useless oldest brother. You got two options, get a job, or you're getting kicked out. He calls her bluff. The law's on her side. And he gets kicked out. Well, his only option is to go to the temple and join the temple workforce. Maybe he's the one who's cleaning everybody's chamber pots. It's a, a ignoble job now, but at least he's got clothes on his back. He's got a place to sleep and he's got regular meals every day. And our family daughter, our head of household, Harimatu, she's now managing the family's farm, the household slaves, making sure her youngest brother uh, has enough food and money that he can go away to school, grow up, become a fully-fledged adult, and get a proper job working for the king and then he will inherit control of the household now the daughter still stays a free woman she's a harimatu until the day she dies this can be a typical family household story in uh, almost any day and age other than um, having to declare some, declare your daughter uh, a male in order to inherit uh, your family wealth. Now we just have people, um, you know, that, that's their gender. They were just born wrong and now they want to be legally declared um, male or, or legally declared female. And, you know, that's today's, today's interesting fact that maybe people... 3,000 years down the road will say, isn't that interesting about how they thought about gender? But anyways, this is a kind of what you might expect a typical family to look like and feel like in Mesopotamia. Now back to our King Hammurabi, who not only during his reign turned Babylon from a lowly city power to a major regional authority in the span of just 30 years. Not only did he conquer basically the entirety of Mesopotamia from out of nowhere, he also invested in huge public works projects 
he turned the city of Babylon into a major regional presence, not just militarily, but culturally. If you're uh, a fan of the Civilization video game series, you might think of different ways you can win the game. One is military dominance. Another is cultural dominance. Well, Hammurabi is playing both those games. He's militarily dominating the region in a way nobody has done for hundreds of years. He is also spreading the culture of the Babylon specific city to the rest of the Mesopotamian region. His god, the god of Babylon, is made preeminent amongst all the other gods in all the other cities. Under Hammurabi's reign, Marduk becomes the head god. Babylon becomes effectively the Rome of the region. Babylon is the head religious city-state. It's not only a place of military dominance from where the king operates from, it's the place where all religious authority emanates from. And the Babylonian culture spreads out from the central city-state to all the neighboring cities. So Hammurabi, he's playing the game of civilization as though I'm going to win it every way possible. My language goes everywhere. My religion goes everywhere. My culture goes everywhere. And my army follows behind it. So Hammurabi is a majorly significant king, not only for his law codes but also his ability to turn the city of Babylon into what is effectively the central location or heart of all of Mesopotamia. All culture, all religion emanates from his city and his public works projects reflect that. He turns the city into what is effectively a major tourist attraction. It's a cultural center or locus that draws people in. The walls are beautified, the city gates are beautified, the temples are beautified, roads are built, temples are rebuilt. Not only is he an amazing military uh, authority, but he is also amazing public works authority. And it's rare that you see both of those things in one king in basically any time period. Now it's unfortunate for Hammurabi that he didn't spend more time making his children as capable as he was. While he may have been amazing military and civil works and political leadership skills, his parroting skills suffered. And Babylon had a short-lived emergence as a regional military authority. It was quickly overcome once his children took the reins. But one of the lasting impacts Hammurabi had, even if Babylon as the city doesn't militarily dominate the region, its religion and cultural dominance continued even into the hundreds of years past his death. Now this episode's already getting quite long, and I don't know what your appetite is for length of episode. I'm assuming that you're pausing and playing this as you need to. But also, I don't want to, again, turn this into a 20-episode series going over 
uh, the history of Babylon while we build up to our main event. We do need to talk about another major player in our story, and that is the Assyrians. This will be it for uh, episode two of our Babylonian series. I guess it's going to turn into a three-parter. In part three, we're going to introduce the city of Asher and the Assyrians their impact on the Babylonians, but also the emperor of mankind is going to show up as one of, potentially one of several kings of Assyria. And we're going to find out uh, just how many times the Temple of Babylon has been destroyed and how the emperor could be any one or many of the kings of Assyria and related nations. We're going to dig into the Warhammer 40,000 text. We're going to go into that in a lot of detail, see how that compares to what the Temple of Babylon actually would have looked like uh, when it was destroyed, who did it, what was the impacts of that, um, both in the text what would that mean to the people of, um, you know, Earth's alternate Warhammer 40,000 history? But also, what does that mean to the people of Babylon uh, and the fallout from that from the Assyrians? Because it's kind of funny. And also, at the same time, makes for great storytelling. So looking forward to that in episode three of our three-part series on the... Warhammer 40,000 and the destruction of the Tower of Babel. Thank you very much for listening for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you again next month. Bye-bye.